Okay, and welcome everyone to our fourth cafe or cyber cafe Sci. now where we'll be talking to Raz about extreme vocals and the importance of vowels in extreme vocals and how he coaches people to do them and I think some demonstrations there will be videos shortly I'm just switching a few things around in the uh, studio here there we go so hopefully you've got some video now at least of me and sorry about that I will put Raz on soon uh, just the brief introduction first welcome to Cafe Sci as some of you know we were a physical Cafe Sci uh, started out in Woking some years ago, ran in a wine bar, then in an art gallery, and we're going to move to a cafe when circumstances changed, and we've brought it online. Uh, ignore the cat behind the curtain. Um, we're now running it weekly to give people something to do, and because there's been positive enough feedback that I'm enjoying doing it, and we seem to have uh, speakers who are enjoying it as well. So. With all of that, I'd like to introduce you to the lead vocalist of Diamond Head, uh, Rasmus Bom Anderson, who will be talking about the science of music, how people train for extreme vocals and the importance of vowels in music. And as I said, if you have any questions, just drop them in the Q&A or stick your hand up and I'll talk to you and interrupt Raz as needed. And uh, Raz, it's all yours. Hello, everyone. I think this is the first time I'm doing a talk on Zoom, but what can you do when we're all in lockdown, right? So, yeah, there will be some demonstration. You're going to have to excuse me because I've not been singing all day. I've not really warmed up much. So whatever, um, what you call it, um, whatever examples I do will be slightly rough and ready. And also, pardon the, the camera. The camera is literally uh, an ancient, the first ever Apple webcam. So if I look rubbish, it's better. That's why all the grainy stuff. Oh, well, maybe it's just lockdown that's tearing me down. So, <clears throat> I don't know if we have anyone on this chat who is either a trained singer or a practicing singer or know anything about vocals. So, I'm going to sort of uh, approach this a little bit with some uh, a crash course in, in how the voice works because that, that's sort of part of the knowledge and the science that we want to talk a little bit about today. So, as a crash course, um, when I speak to a lot of people and we talk about what is the voice, the first thing that people go to is uh, the larynx, right? right there. You know, everyone would go, oh man, that's a great voice. And that, that sort of has a, a centric function and makes everybody think that you're singing from that little part, which in fact is not really true because the voice is your entire body. It's a lot of different functions that act together to create um, a voice that, um, that can be whatever you want, essentially. Um, but what I really want to just lock down right now is that I want us to disconnect from the larynx, pardon the beard, the voice as being where we are singing from. The, 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 the larynx literally encapsulates and protects your vocal cords and your vocal cords is what creates pitch, but it's not necessarily where you sing from. It just generates the pitch. So we've got to think of it as a pitch oscillation, which we control uh, with how much air we can <clears throat> provide and cause the lips to sort of connect under. So 440 hertz, that's 440 times a second that they are connecting. So that's the essential of uh, what is the voice box. And that's, I want us to just disconnect from that. It's just the thing that creates pitch, okay? Now, um, the rest of it is basically the entire body. You've got your lungs, they provide the oxygen. Your abdominal muscles are crucial for right technique because they're the ones that are, that are going to control how your lungs and chest collapse because as a natural function as a human and most species, we are born to run, race, and hunt. So therefore, we need to quickly expel uh, CO2 and take in oxygen as fast as possible. But as singers, we have to re-engineer that because we want to keep our oxygen as long as we can and control the outlet as we like and for whatever purposes um, in when you're singing, right? So I want us to focus on just the, the whole body is your voice. Your bones resonate, everything else resonates. But what I want to just quickly crash into and divide it. So your lungs, that's your fuel, your... Um, vocal cords you actually have two sets but your vocal cords are 
your pitch generator, and then there's a whole lot of stuff that happens above that, including what's called the epiglottis tongue, which is something I'm going to touch upon. Uh, and if anyone ever wants to really check out a lot more science about um, distortion and singing, then complete vocal technique or CVT is a good thing to, um, to check out. I'm just seeing here, could you increase the sound? We're on max volume. It's a bit hard to hear. If I talk louder, does that help? Trevor Banks? Okay. I think I'll just talk louder. It's just because I'm sparing my voice or I'll turn up my preamp a bit. Maybe that helps a bit. I'm just scared that when I start to do any screaming and stuff, it gets too loud. But we'll just see where we get to. Okay, so vocal cords in your larynx. Above this or right behind it, you've got like a, a, what's called the epiglottis tongue. That's the thing that goes back whenever you swallow or water any drink or eat food. That's a, a very important part of the technique that we're going to talk about here when it comes to creating distortion. Okay, distortion heavy vocals, extreme vocals, all of that stuff happens above the vocal cords. And this is where what's really important to understand and why I'm trying to separate your uh, vocal cords and your voice box, because all of that heavy stuff happens above it. Yeah. <clears throat> so once we can understand that and get rid of that, we, uh, we can actually move forward to doing what's called safe, heavy, extreme vocals, if you like. Um, and, and avoid some, any mistakes and, and things that can actually cause damage because you can cause damage to your voice if you, if you don't do things right. Um, so to those who don't know much about singing, that was a very quick crash course and what we're going to talk about. There's loads more to it, but I can't talk about all that in 15 minutes alone. I'd actually need about an hour or two hours. Um, so uh, Within the voice, you have a couple of different ranges and we just mark them out straight for you. What I'm talking in right now, that's the chest range. It's also where you find most of all your energies, the deep resonance, and that's what goes up and becomes your power. Yay! That kind of chest range, it's power, right? Then you also have your head voice, which sounds like it's coming from the top. Yay! <clears throat> there we go. Yeah! All this stuff, that's your head voice. Now, that's just to clear it up. And if anyone knows the term falsetto, that's an effect. A lot of people talk to me about falsetto when they talk about ranges, and it's not a range, it's an effect where you leave air flowing through your vocal cords so you get that <laughs> breathy sound and quality. Okay, we got that cleared up. So here's what we're talking about. In extreme vocals, we need to be able to, uh, first of all, attain energy and compress that energy and that's where the tongue comes into effect that if glottis tongue that just tips back so if this is the back wall this is your throat or your trachea and here is your the top of your larynx uh, or your voice box inside there is a tongue which is the epiglottis tongue that stops uh, food and drink for coming down into your lungs this is the tool that we use when we cause uh, distortion or compression to our voice. It's also referred to as twang. Um, and that's where you get a sort of a harsh increase in both volume and energy. So when I'm doing a, say, a standard note, I'm, yeah! But if I add more distortion to it, that's this twang. That's, I'll try and do, if you imagine this is the tongue lowering and I'm adding and subtracting compression to this. Yeah! So if you see the amount of sort of energy and loudness that comes from all that grit and distortion, that's from that slight little movement with the epiglottis tongue. Now, besides this, that's the tool that we use to create the compression. Above that tongue, which is um, sort of in to the back of your throat, essentially, back of your throat, your palate, both the soft and the hard palate, and also very importantly, your pharynx, where your... Um, resonance chambers are. Those are all in incredibly important parts of creating tone and singing. And this is where vowels are very important, especially for distortion. Um, I teach a lot about vowels not being uh, as important to enunciate. Unless you're in musical theater and you want to be expressive to the last consonant. <clears throat> but in singing, if you all remember, there was that thing going around where you would see uh, a sentence and you'd only have the first and the last letter. Now, regardless of what that sentence was, you could 
fill in the blanks of what that word and the rest of the sentence was. And it's the same thing for singing because making sort of the vowels work for you and bending vowels. So you're shaping and bending the vowels slightly out of shape to support technique is a crucial part of extreme singing. That's when you hear all the death metal growlers, this all sounds like a woof, 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 but actually they're sort of bending the vowels to give you the, the necessary parts of the words for you to understand what's going on and what the words are. So, you know, um, let's, uh, let's talk something like, uh, I'm trying to think of a quick sentence. Like on the last record we did, we had uh, a song called Belly of the Beast. And the chorus, I mean, I don't know why I wrote that chorus. It's just stupid high. But the chorus is suffer, suffer in the belly of the beast. That's quite a big mouthful. So to access those words at those notes, suffer! I'm not saying suffer. I'm saying suffer. So I'm taking that that word and the vowels of the U and almost bending it into an A to make it work for me to hit the note and that technique, if that makes sense. So bending and shaping vowels is crucial to get a, a decent workflow, if you like. Uh, what I try and teach people is that when you have a song, you do a, a, a map of your words, a map of your vowels, so a vowel map so you can easily uh, get through to all of your uh, pitches and your technique without having strain. Because if you're trying to hit a certain note, and if you're not willing to bend that vowel, you're gonna end up with something that's gonna cause tightness, tightness in your muscles, because all of this is a muscular function, uh, from your abs to your jaw to your lips, and you wanna be relaxed when you're hitting <laughs> tough notes. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the importance of vowels. Um, I'll give you a bit more example of it. But what I wanna really stress upon, and this, if there's any scientists out there that can help me with this, please talk to me because I would love to know if anyone has a way of, of measuring this um, because what I teach as well is a theory of resonance and ball of light. So I know that sounds weird, but I want people to imagine that there's a ball of light of resonance that carries your sound as a singer. And this is something that's quite advanced, but it, it really helps people. And a lot, uh, I have a lot of students who say, uh, sort of, they, they will call me up and say, damn you, you've opened up Pandora's box because now I hear every other singer and how they're using this resonance wrong. Uh, or not wrong, but to not necessarily the best of the uh, extent of possibility. So talking about this ball of light, um, I, wanna, I want to imagine that if we have the mouth cavity here and then we have the pharynx cavity up here and at the back, you have your nasal pharynx, which is the access hole for when you are breathing through your nose. It still goes all the way down into your lungs, but it's not coming through your mouth. Now, between that access point and your mouth cavity and your pharynx cavity, you can actually move the sound around in a two-dimensional form. I'm going to try and, and present this to you. It might not be easy, but I'm, I'm going to try and sort of point to where it's moving. So let's try this. This, this is also referred to as placement. So what I'm really happy about, a lot of um, vocal uh, professionals are talking more about placement and vowels as an important factor these days. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm behind on a lot of the science because I've finished uni several years ago. Anywho, so ball of light of resonance. Ooh, it's all the front here, right? Ooh. I know that sounds weird. But the fact that you can move your sound around like that gives you a lot of potential to shape your tone and also release space to access other notes. So when I'm doing a lot of these high screaming notes, what I actually do is I'm blending things and distorting it. So it's a multitude of functions from breathing right, doing the pitch, creating the compression, shaping the vowel with my uh, soft palate, my tongue, my teeth, all my articulators to blending the resonance in my mask and my mouth. That's all the function of each note. But the words is what's gonna really help. When you know your word, you know your vowel shape or how you're gonna bend it, that's when you get into a, a, what I like to think of the best possible key and sound. So let's do a little bit of um, distortion. So I hope this doesn't sort of blow your speakers because I don't know what it sounds like on your side. And again, I haven't warmed up, so we'll see what sounds come out. Um, so in general on screams, anything that's up, for me, a chest voice, uh, I'm comfortable around a C or C sharp. 
which is probably around. Yay! Now I'm going to hold that and I'm going to try and, and change the vowel a bit. And you'll see how the tone and the quality actually changes. Yeah! Even from a uh, uh, because I'm bending it so far, I'm going from a normal yeah! from a note to a scream. Obviously, I'm not going to do a, a, a word on ah, you know, it's, it's just a sound, sort of like the the uh, death core. Bah! You know, that, that blech sound. I can't remember who the hell came up with that or where, what, what band he's from. But even that, that small function of just changing and bending that vowel uh, means that I can actually access a screen that's a lot safer and more gritty. So in between, say, uh, singing Belly of the Beast, suffer! Suffer! I'm actually taking the vowel and shaping it three ways to hit those la 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 notes. Oh. That's the importance of vowels, uh, essentially. How are we doing for time? I, I don't know what time we started and if people are bored or well, I'm just rambling. Uh, no one's dropped off yet. So oh. I'm guessing people aren't bored. And yeah, they're, <laughs> you're not rambling. It's interesting. Um, carry on until you're done. Well, I can keep talking. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's just... Uh, it's all complicated and, and, and it depends how much information. Usually I'm always terrified that I'm overloading my students a lot of the time. Well, shall we give people a few minutes to ask any questions? Then you can, can bounce do. off those. Yeah, I actually, I forgot to present one thing. I mean, uh, again, with ranges, we talked about um, the chest voice and the head voice. Those are the general ranges. You also have a mix range, which is usually a head mix, which is what you hear in a lot of, of metal music, the, the sort of almost operatic, you know, like, um, I know he will never admit it, but, you know, singer, Iron Maiden, Bruce Dickinson, legend, uh, sings a lot in a mix, but he, he probably wouldn't. Um, uh, how do I voluntarily control the epiglottis? I'll get to that. So um, what a lot of these singers do is what's called a mix, and it's where they blend the two ranges of the head voice. So uh, if you imagine, so I'm just going to move over here. <clears throat> so if you imagine that you have your two ranges as a weight scale, right? So this one here is going to be a, your chest voice. And when that's fully loaded, your head voice goes up, right? You don't use that at all. So when that's fully loaded, that's when you're at your max sort of chest quality. Yay! And then what you do when you do a mix is you blend those two qualities. Now I'll do it and I'll do it badly. Yay! Oh, wasn't that bad. But you know, that's, that's the quality of blending and mixing your, your range again. That's why you use it, a lot of these things use it to simulate an extended range. So that's why when you hear that, and all that Yahoo, you think it's actually chest, but it's actually a mixed range. Um, something that I've been sort of working on and describing a lot and introduced to the last uh, British Voice Association uh, gathering uh, when I was a guest speaker. Um, was actually something that uh, has been coined by a friend of mine, uh, the hypermix. So what I just presented is a hypermix, and you can tell that it becomes lighter in texture, um, but then um, you can actually add energy and distortion to it. Uh, in CVT, or complete vocal technique, they will refer to it as neutral with distortion. But for me, the easiest way to describe it with the, the global terminology that's available outside of that uh, in CVT is actually a hypermix because it's mixed, but it's hyped up with a lot more energy. So to recap, chest voice, yeah, mix, yeah, hyper mix. I'm gonna go up because it needs it. Yeah, a lot more energy, a lot more power, and also higher pitch. So it actually sounds like my chest range is has the sorry, my hyper mix has the same energy as my chest range, which is silly, really. And also I regret sometimes writing the notes that I do, but this actually helps me sort of get through it. So I'll get to that uh, question. How do you voluntarily control your epiglottis? So you do it by learning to um, make sound, by producing a certain sound. So if you go, ah, ah, nah, 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 ah, twang it, you know? Sort of like a proper New Yorker or, or I don't know, an Italian mobster. 
That's how you get that sound. Ah, that's that's what's going to help you learn to voluntarily do that. Ah, essentially, that's how I voluntarily control it. A lot of the times for other stuff like death metal, not that I practice that a lot or or really do it at all. Um, you actually do the opposite. You focus the epiglottis and push it forward in uh, towards to to create more space in your your trachea for all of that um, that heavy stuff. I'm not very good at it, but I'll present something here for you. That's more fo focusing and pushing it forward to create that kind of a texture and quality. Um, there's also other ways you can do it. I always, if I, if I do it live, I'll do a, what's called the inward pig squeal, which I think is cheating, but some people don't think it is. I probably can't do it now, but we'll give it a go. But even there, you can hear how the vowels are actually shaped and sort of create a phonetic word. The vowels and phonetics are sort of the key to do that. Can you feel, are you aware of the movement? Um, you are, but it's more like, um, you know how you feel when you're swallowing? There's sort of a, um, a, it's not tightness, but you can feel that there is a movement of something, like a, like a gear shift, if you like. I like to, to talk of it as a gear shift. And in fact, the whole system of singing, I like to put into the parts of a car and how that, uh, together with all the gears, with the petrol, with the speed, you know, the, the throttle, everything. That, that's how I like to think about it. So that, that's essentially, you can feel it, but it's more, <clears throat> it's more clear in what's coming out as sound. The whole, I mean, I can do it so far to the limit where I'm actually almost choking myself um, what with bending that epiglottis back. Um, but, you know, I could talk about for everything forever about um, anatomy and, and techniques and my We've we've got a couple of other questions that came in. Um, one of them is, or two of them, are about the reverb. Yeah. Uh, and it's why can why can they hear the reverb? You can hear the reverb because oh, I can't do this the other way around. Actually, I was going to take the camera off, but it's again a very old camera. So the way that I'm talking through this mic is not through um, just my Mac because I'm in my studio right now. I've been working all day here. Uh, so actually it's coming through a channel strip which has EQ, compression, etc. And it's sent through a reverb. And I can turn it up. This is good. Well, I can just mute it. And then you have a dead sound with a little bit of delay. So it's just because it's running through an interface and it helps me uh, with all the stuff I'm singing. So yeah, it's just better to monitor that way as a singer. You always want to hear a bit of reverb, a bit of delay and all that stuff. And uh, the other one that's come in so far is, have you worked with acoustics people to model the pharynx larynx sound system? No, I haven't. I don't even know how to get in touch with them. Um, I think, again, uh, the theory that I know about how to move the sound around, I don't know how you would measure the acoustics of that because it's so complex. Um, I think you'd have to develop some kind of algorithm that can measure it almost in a virtual 2D platform. Um, and I have no idea. I mean, I, I talked to some people about maybe getting in touch with people at Caltech in the U S and see if they've got some, uh, specialists over there that can maybe talk about it. But you know, it's, it's a theory, it's my theory. And, uh, I just try and teach it the way it works. So, uh, not so much a question, but a comment that the university of Surrey have a French horn, which is straight and sounds the same. So you uh, might be able to reduce the 2d to 1d. Yeah, I mean, they do say that uh, out of all the horn instruments in an orchestral section, the French horn is actually one that mimics the voice the most. Um, I mean, I love French horns. I think they're beautiful. I don't necessarily think it can do some of the distortion or death metal growls uh, <laughs> in extreme vocals, but it's definitely one of the most beautiful uh, horns in the orchestra. By the way, I'm drinking Corona tonight because this is all silly. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? I'll give it a few minutes. Yeah, no, I'm happy to just talk. Yeah. I am now wondering what a um, death metal brass band would sound like. You know what? I'm sure it will exist out there. Uh, I think 
uh, whatever you wish for, the internet will provide. Um, the, you know, the, there's all types. I mean, metal has progressed in so many ways into so many different subgenres that it's hard to keep track. And everything just keeps getting heavier and heavier and heavier. Um, so I don't know where it's going to end up in, in 10 years. It would just be one big <laughs> sound, and that's going to be what metal people like. Okay, and there's another one. How does it work when someone's got a very large range from death growls to operatics? Uh, and the example was the singer from Arch Enemy. So Arch Enemy, which, which one of them are you talking about? Because they've had a couple of singers. That's the question. The one, from years ago. <clears throat> uh, one, one from 10 years ago, I'm told. So it wouldn't, it's not, uh, what's her name? Guzman, Elysia Guzman, or whatever her name is. Um, so the thing about um, that kind of death metal uh, and range is that you've got you to gotta try and think, from a vocal perspective, you're talking about uh, how the functions uh, are together, right? Um, and when you do stuff like metal growls or metal singing like Arch Enemy, or my favorite is actually, um, oh, what's her name, from Ginger. If anyone knows them, that is, that is a singer to check out because she, you, you wouldn't believe it's a, it's a woman and she can sing both beautiful in, in a clean voice, but also these incredibly low growls that I, I don't think I can ever get to that. Um, so in terms of those kind of things, that range is, is about pitch, but also... Uh, about energy, if you ask me, because, you know, Mariah Carey has what's called a whistle range, which is up there, and that's where the vocal cords connect right at the back, so they're sort of solid all the way to the back, and then there's just a little gap where it float, uh, sort of um, vibrates together. I can't, I can do it inwards sometimes, like that, but I can't do it outwards, but that's okay, I don't want to be Mariah Carey. Um, the thing is, it's, it's, it's not so much about range as it's about how you use your range because I have about four and a half octaves and if I actually count the vocal fry, I can go down to the lowest note on piano, but I can't sing on it. So what's the point of it? So I think four and a half octaves is enough to sort of have a very wide sonic landscape and actually you'd be fine with two and a half or three. <clears throat> was that actually, did I answer that question or can I have the question again? Uh, I, I think it was answered <clears throat> and there's quite a few more that have come in so uh, probably worth dealing with those. Um, I was taught vocal cords can make pitch or tone or noise which is more chaotic-ish. So um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that. So uh, the thing is about the vocal cords, the true vocal cords which sit in the larynx. So if we say, um, let's see if I can do this. So if this is the front of the voice box, right? So this is your larynx. Within that, you have your um, two vocal cords, the true vocal cords that sit around here, if that makes sense. This is really hard to show on a, <laughs> on a camera like this. Essentially, you've got two sets. You've got your true vocal cords, which stretch all the way from the back, which are connect by, uh, connected with two sort of hook-like things called arytenoids that you basically stretch and open them, close them, if that makes sense, okay? Um, above your uh, true vocal cords or vocal folds, you have what's called the false vocal cords, which is sort of a, two small ligaments that sit inside. They don't connect to the front and the back. They just sit on the front. And those are the ones that you generally, especially with distortion for the... <coughs> all that stuff is actually a lot of air coming out because you're trying to create that uh, big gap and big space. And the false vocal folds is actually what you use to produce a lot of these noise. Um, with a lot of noise or effects like you, you're talking about that's actually more sort of the back of the throat where you, you can even use spit or saliva to create certain things uh, I mean there are so many textures and there, everyone has a unique voice that's the beautiful thing about singing every person is unique by genetics you know no one is alike but you can learn to copy sounds and actually that's the best exercise anyone could do for singing is literally copy sound I mean, I, I've dri I drove my parents nuts trying to sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger and now Schmeagel and whoever. But it's quite a valuable thing. It teaches you about the extent of your voices. You know, and even though you might sound a bit mad. But hey, that's the fun part. Okay. Uh, is there any difference between male and female technique? Not technique, but in range and genetics, yes. Um, the, you do have the the odd unique scenario where someone has a, a, a very deep voice or even a high voice. 
Um, I can't actually remember. They have a new scientific term for this now, and I can't actually remember what it's called. They told me about it at the last BVA thing. But technique-wise, everyone's the same. Um, the one thing I always tell people is for a, a, a safe, solid, and um, voice that's going to have a lot of longevity, your chest voice is important and the, the biggest key, in my opinion. But that's also for rock and metal and heavy singing. But it's better to have that tool at the max power that you can and then not necessarily use it at the max. Um, a lot of singers, especially with females, they get taught uh, to use their higher range and the, their mix and that head voice because uh, they have that kind of quality quite natural. To get into that powerful range, it's sort of, um, I mean, there's so much psychology in this as well because, you know, in school, uh, the boys are the loud ones, the, the girls are the well-behaved, so well-behaved, you know. Uh, and that whole mentality actually makes uh, an impact on how people use their voice. Uh, I mean, I could go into talking about bullying and all that stuff and how many of these things actually create factors in uh, your psychology that actually inhibit your voice. And your voice is actually a massive emotional center for, for most humans, um, for both expression, but also to, to lock things in, if that makes sense. What is the lowest note you can sing? Is that the... Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I tried to test it once at a, at, a, at a venue in Vancouver, actually. They had a, a, a spectrum analyzer at the front of house. And uh, I always do this little uh, throat singing warm-up thing because it's just fun. Uh, we used it on one album that was in 2016 on Silence. And it's, um, it, I'm not perfect at it at all, but it's... Uh, <laughs> all of this stuff. And I think I went down to about 50 Hertz, which I can't remember where that is, but that's really low. Um, at least around there. Okay. And um, extreme vocals sound hard on the vocal cords. How do you protect them? Well, like I said, to begin with, um, the extreme vocals don't happen on the vocal cords. This is the point of disconnecting the idea that you sing from that voice box. You do not sing from that voice box. What you do is you generate pitch. The vocal cords are literally two um, ligaments like this, right? So they open, they close. And if these are, this is the original, it's that pulls them back and opens them up if you like. So they are just connecting like that, but at incredible speeds to generate and vibrate and create pitch but you don't ever really create the distortion from them. If you do try and do that, that's when things go a bit wrong, such as um, nodules, et cetera. But the, the whole idea is if you understand that that's just a pitch oscillator, that everything happens above, then you're safe. As long as you understand that. Uh, what happens is a lot of people try and create distortion and sing from their voice box because that's how they think. But that means they are squeezing all their muscles around here, these all constrictor muscles around here to sort of tighten around the larynx to create something because they don't know how to do it externally besides here. When actually it comes from power, sustaining the airflow, goes through the pitch generator, the vocal cords. And then above that is where we create the distortion, the, the uh, harsh qualities, if you like. In death metal growls, obviously it's actually not about the chords as much as the false vocal cords, because they're the ones that sort of produce the harmonic pitch. <clears throat> okay, and a technical one. Uh, when music is compressed, for example, by MP3, it's modeled on what's thought technically to be perceptibly important, but that might not match the sounds you're making. So do extreme vocals come across in streaming or digitized music? So in anything that's digitized, uh, because you're talking about the compression of audio, and we, we're talking, uh, you know, studio techniques right now, or studio talk, uh, compressed um, audio will always lose some quality, specifically more in the high end. And depending on how it's encoded, you will either lose more quality of it. Um, it's very hard to hear for a lot of people, um, but you will hear it in the top end. The top end dies a bit, and there are some dynamics that you lose. Uh, what's more fascinating is actually uh, compressed audio affects you differently emotionally. So <clears throat> uh, an interesting experiment you could run is, for example, uh, a beautiful record by Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life. Uh, you try and play that on a vinyl player and then play it on an MP3 afterwards and see how it affects you. Because that's actually what's been done more research into how it actually affects you. 
you know, MP3s, streaming services, yeah, it's easy, it's convenient, but uh, if you are true about the audio, you know, you will get a record player and get records if you can. But to be honest, if you really want to be impacted by music, which what music is there for, go see the live bands if you can afford them. Or you more go to see bands you don't know that are cheap and you can afford to go see them. You know, that's, that's the way that, um, you know, you can get impacted by it. Did, I hope that answered your question. And I think we've got one more. Uh, how long did it take you to become aware and learn to control all the different areas involved in singing? It took many, many years. Um, I didn't really start singing properly until I was about 17, I think, and I was rubbish. It took me about a year to reach my first A in chest, and I literally thought my head was going to explode from from holding that kind of energy in and releasing it the right way. Because you got to think of it almost like a valve. You're sort of releasing it. <clears throat> um, it took me, and then I went to uni about when I was 21 over here. That's when I moved to the UK. Uh, and I was okay to hit the high C's by then, but not with a, a, a nice quality, so I could hit the pitch, etc. Uh, it was only at uni when I learned about CVT, and that's when I started uh, getting into more of the distortion stuff because there was some scientific information at that point to show how it worked. Uh, CVT has progressed massively since um, 2006 or seven, whatever year it was that we had our first master class. Um, so, you know, um, it took me, I think I'd even go as far as to say to where I am now, probably didn't happen until 2017. That's when I really came into sort of linking every bit of knowledge that I have and creating something that also is more recognizable to me as my voice personally, how I like to sound, how I want to sound. Uh, and I managed to get there by researching these tools personally and, and working out the techniques, uh, and uh, shaping that and now developing more of these theories that I like to, um, to, to use to, to teach others the same and similar tools. Um, but yeah, um, I should actually point out there are several systems within uh, singing techniques or terminologies. Uh, complete vocal technique, CVT by Catherine Sadlin is one. Uh, you also have the Estelle technique, which is, um, I can't remember the name, Okay. Uh, but that's the um, Berkeley Press. And then you also have Seth Riggs, which is uh, um, SLS singing, speech level singing. Um, so depending on what sort of approach you want to do, um, those are sort of the main three systems that, that, are, that are out there as a, a, a um, academically acknowledged system of teaching, if you like. Uh, but if you are interested in distortion, you can't go wrong with CVT. You also have Melissa Cross, Melissa Cross has some fantastic theories and uh, she's a good one to check out uh, if that's what you're into. But uh, there's some science missing on that for now, but I, th um, I met her at the BVA meeting and it's in the works, which is fantastic. Um, there's also stuff you can learn there, but CVT is definitely where I would go to if you're interested in that kind of stuff. And they actually have, they, they have a book, but now it's all transcribed into an app, um, which actually you can buy. It's not cheap but it's a, a lifetime upgrade anyways for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there are just a couple more. Um, one is, what sort of things do you do to practice? Sorry, I laugh because I'm really rubbish at practicing. But the one thing that I do practice, because I've got the rest of the techniques pretty much locked in as very solid, which is... Um, Range, chest voice, mix, hypermix. The thing I spend my time with most is actually um, working through how can I bend vowels differently to create different screams uh, and, and more of these textures. Uh, so that's actually what I spend most time. It's more about shaping vowels, bending vowels, tonal shaping for different voices, voice qualities that I like. Uh, and, you know, I think most singers will spend a long time trying to find their sound. And once you sort of get too close to finding it, that's probably what you focus most of your time on. Um, besides that, it's always just uh, focus on, on passaggio, break points, extend range. Uh, my general range is now up to, I'm comfortable at a D, uh, depending on the word uh, and vowel and how I bend that vowel. And my E flat is my nemesis. D sharp E flat is my nemesis. Uh, and that's the note I'm always trying to um, to sort of focus on hitting 
I don't know if I can actually find no, all my guitars are drop tune right now. So I can't find any flat off the top of my head, but I know that's my breaking point in my chest voice where I have to change my technique to continue up the, the range up the scales, if you like. So when I hit that E flat, I either have to bend the vowel, change the mechanisms, change my approach or anything like that. So those are the things that I practice mainly, um, you know, to infinity and beyond and in the range. Okay. And uh, the other one is um, when or where can we next hear Diamond Head live? Genuine question that's come in. Uh, well, you know what? I would love to answer that. But right now, the music industry, the toying industry is in absolute tatters we don't really know what's going on um i don't i i'm you know we have dates booked in that i don't know if they're gonna be postponed i just saw wacken was cancelled the uh, the other day and and the german government i think are ceasing all live events so i honestly i don't know um it's a, a pain in my um, my spirit so to speak so i don't know but um if you want to hear diamond head go check out the coffin train it's uh, it's on all the social media. If you really want to check out something cool, check out the Coffin Train music video. I'm very proud of that one. Um, that's something that's uh, that's really cool. And obviously, if you like the music, support bands. Like right now, bands are struggling to eat food, pay rent, um, because we can't work. So buy merch, buy CDs, buy whatever you can find, or just help bands if you if you want to help keep um, the music industry going. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll make sure that the link to the Diamond Head YouTube playlist is in the description. Uh, I was listening to it earlier and it is good. Okay. Uh, we don't have any other questions, uh, not at the moment anyway. So unless some come in before I finish the wrap up. Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm not a musical person at all. So I had no idea about most of the stuff uh, the closest i've got to singing is having stubbed my toe so well, really thank you for that so, you know you, you've basically been doing extreme vocals without knowing it uh, it's not a method i want to repeat no. um we do cafe sci currently every week on a thursday with great speakers like raz uh, volunteering their time to talk um, I'm also going to be trying something new uh, from next week. So watch this space. There may be a connection to it. Uh, the time change was particularly for this session, as I believe Raz had some noise next door, um, which would have disrupted otherwise. So the regular time will be seven o'clock, but as it's online, there's no need to travel to a venue. We are much more flexible on that than we used to be. Don't forget clapping for NHS at 8 o'clock. Yes, and the clapping for NHS. We don't want to clash with that for obvious reasons. Okay, so uh, Raz, thank you again. And uh, This is available to anyone who wants to watch it again or share it with friends on not all of our many, many live streaming platforms. If you'd like to applaud, you can do it by quickly clicking the raise and lower hand button. And um, so there we go. We've got a nice Mexican wave going on, actually. Raz, again, thank you and uh, good night, everyone. <laughs>